Okay. Yeah, well, about the regime, so uh, obviously you know because you're from close to that area. Um, um, so uh, when, for instance, Russia proposed to uh, Afrin uh, that the regime would come to Afrin, the, the deal was basically to hand over Afrin completely uh, to the regime. There was not like a, a possible idea that, for instance, just send like regime forces to the border <coughs> and you can just have your own administration. That was not the deal. But then when uh, Turkey attacked, there was later with some regime forces that actually went there and that they actually got slaughtered by Turkish airstrikes. A uh, very small force. Uh, but I think personally, if the US is really withdrawing, the regime knows this. I don't see why the uh, regime would say to the northeast of Syria, like, you keep your own administration and then we'll protect your border for free. I think they're going to have like huge, they're going to demand huge concessions. Um, there were actually, uh, when first Trump was talking about pulling out from. Um, from Syria in April, and when there was the Mombich deal in June, like last summer, there were talks between the regime and the Syrian Democratic Council and the Future Party, uh, but they didn't result in anything because the regime said, like, we want to have full control over all of these areas. They're not saying, they were not uh, willing to give a lot of concessions. So I think, especially if the US is now clearly saying we're going to pull out, and they're not going to say, for instance, we're going to pull out unless the regime and they have, and them have a deal, then I don't see the reason why the regime would accept like huge concessions. Um, but I think that the, the leadership in the northeast of Syria, they would be willing for us to say, okay, we're gonna give the oil and the gas and the major infrastructure and resources to you and in order to have like some form of administration autonomy. Uh, but I think it's very, I think the regime is just gonna want to have all. About the Peshmerga Rojava, so there were like uh, Iraqi uh, Kurds, they trained a number of Syrian Kurds. Uh, in 2012 they started training them, but um, the YPG said we are not going to allow them to return uh, because um, they are not, uh, we don't want to have a dual system like we have in Iraqi Kurdistan. We don't want to have two security forces. Uh, unless they accept our control and command, then maybe we're going to accept them in some form. Uh, so recently, you know, there were some ideas that maybe Turkey will not attack the northeast of Syria if you put this Rojava Peshmerga on the border. Uh, so I think uh, this was also the idea of the team of James Jeffrey to see if the SDF was open for that issue. So it's very unclear to me if, because James Jeffrey recently said in a statement that they actually entered and they are on the border. But from the information I have from Syria, that's not really the case. Uh, but it's a little bit difficult to say. Um, and I mean, if uh, putting Rojava Peshmerga on the border and it will stop a Turkish attack, of course it would be welcome. Uh, but I think the whole situation changed now because Trump has want to pull out completely from Syria. So we're not talking anymore like in the past when you had the James Jeffrey plan, making some concessions here and there to make Turkey happy and then they can focus on the regime. If like Trump completely pulls out, that doesn't matter if you put Rojava Peshmerga there, you put somewhere on other group there. Uh, there were also some talks with Ahmed Jarba, who was the former head of the Syrian opposition. Uh, we used to have some forces fighting in Raqqa separately from the SEF. There were also some talks that he went to Turkey to have some form of a proposal. Um, but I think this also didn't went anywhere because I think Turkey just wants to destroy this project completely. And also, uh, I forgot to say that in my presentation, there are elections coming up in Turkey in March. Uh, and last time when Turkey took control of Afrin, it uh, helped Erdogan with his popularity. So if he has another operation or something, he can raise the Turkish sentiment. They will forget about the economic crisis, the very bad economic situation, the corruption in Turkey, the arrest in Turkey. So it's like a way to distract the Turkish public opinion from the internal problems. If there's a war with the Kurds, with the PKK, with the Syrian Kurds. We saw this also with the referendum, uh, like some Iraqi Kurdish politicians were hoping that Turkey might accept a referendum, you know, to have like economic trade because then Kurdistan region, would, if it will become independent, will be dependent on Turkey for trade. But at that time, uh, Turkey had his presidential referendum and Erdogan needed the nationalist vote, so he could not be seen as the president that allows the acceptance of an independent Kurdish state. So then he was completely against the referendum, which also completely destroys the Turkish narrative that they are just against the PKK. 
uh, they're basically against any form of uh, Kurdish status in the region. Because even when U.S. invaded Iraq, uh, Turkey was against um, against such a thing. Uh, they were actually were afraid also that the Kurds would get a status, a legal status in Iraq. And I remember when the U.S. Uh, there was the Houdin incident. I don't remember when it was in 2003, 2004. Uh, when the U.S. Special Forces arrested Turkish soldiers that were planning to assassinate the Kurdish governor of Kirkuk. Uh, and then later, only in 2007 or 2008, Turkey sort of accepted the KRG. Um, so I think that's another situation. The conscription question and the acceptance of Arabs with that. Well, I mean, conscription is not popular among uh, Syrian Kurds either. I mean, it caused a lot of uh, immigration. One of the reasons immigration, of course, another. I we've seen some people saying that, for instance, there are 200,000 people displaced from Kobani, and now they're sort of blaming the PYE for that. That's not true because 200,000 people in Kobani fled for ISIS. Um, so it's a little bit complicated. But about the conscription issue and the grievances and that sort, I mean, they do try to include more Arabs in security forces uh, in that Um But it's, it's and they have also the Terrazor uh, civil council. But it needs, it needs more time to address these issues and also it needs more support, like uh, more stabilization support. Uh, but of course, if Trump just leaves this area, like it probably will fall to the regime. Um, but I think they do, do try to address, address these grievances. And maybe even if there were cases of, of looting, uh, I do think that they try to address these issues and try to combat that. But that is where it's like a very uh, unruly area. There's a lot of ISIS sleeper cells. It's a desert. It's very difficult to control. It's much more difficult to control like an area like Raqqa, which is more an urban environment than like an area because it's like a, a desert area. But um, if you see, for instance, you see the, the Arabs of Deir Zor, who they prefer to choose to between the regime or the SDF, you see that like a lot of them, they actually went uh, to the SDF held areas uh, instead of the regime held areas in, in Derezor city because there's a lot much more stealing there and forced military conscription uh, while for instance the SDF is much more careful to carry out conscription in Arab, Arab areas compared to the Kurdish areas and about the comment of Shivan uh, it's a bit difficult to answer that um, but yeah they're there I think if for instance the West uh, the US they would accept this system to flourish to have, for instance, like James Jeffrey was talking about, it have it similar to 1991 when the Iraqi Kurds established the Kurdistan region government. Uh, I think if they, if the system would be accepted to have have recognition from the West and they would be allowed, I think they would be willing to have more democratic elections. They would be willing to make more reforms. And we are already seeing that that they, for instance, uh, there were some Kurdish media stations that were banned in the past, but they are allowed again. I think if they would have recognition, they would be more willing to open up the system. Um, and I think it would be like a model for the rest of Syria. But if Trump withdraws from Syria, then I don't see what's going to happen with the rest. What I would say on the ideas and values is that the West doesn't conduct its foreign policy on ideas and values. Well, it has. I suspect it won't do for a long time yet, although the German Corbyn government will hopefully shift the, uh, the direction there. We've not got, got that. Um, and so we can't bank on something you've not got. That's the reality. Uh, and so, and that's, I mean, I must say, when I was there speaking to people, actually that was one of the frustrations that I had and uh, Lord Glassman had, that there was often a feeling that we've done the West work, we've provided and supported these values, now we expect it to come back. And the horrible response that we have to give is, don't bank on it. Don't bank on the West ever helping anyone. It's not what the West does, it's not what the West ever does. It, it, it focuses on the money and the geopolitical advantage. So we need to, if you want to keep Trump in, if you want to make sure France stays in, you have to win the argument on the money side, so access to oil revenues, or the geopolitical advantage of staying in. You can't win it on the, it's promoting your values because they don't care. And actually, I would argue that the values are too much. You know, the values of the DFNS creating a bottom-up democracy is probably too much for certain capitalist neoliberal states. 
and actually they would be more than happy to see it disappear. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to continue going around. I've got right. two yes, people there, then two people at the back, and then I'm going to keep going around. Right, okay. I think I, uh, you all may uh, already know the sort of answer to this sort of question, but uh, where is Kurdistan trying to go to? I mean, strategy wise, it, it seems to me that we're all bogged down in sort of tactics. And, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm losing the will to sort of live, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> how the hell anybody could understand what you're saying? And what I'd like to ask is what your sort of, sort of strategy is. Strategy is the sort of vision of where you, you want to go. And I've not heard anything about that, but that's probably because you already know. Uh, uh, but I don't. Um, and, you know... It, it, it's what you need. It, you you need to know where you're trying to get to, and you know, there's nobody. I, I don't know that. So, so where it, are we trying you to could, go? Where's the outcome? Well, there, there's uh, sort of Turkish Kurds. Is Iraq? Yes. Kurds. I mean, how many Kurds are there? I mean, well, is there supposed to be one Kurd? Or I, I don't know. Got, I think we've got the question. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. There. Yeah, good evening. I about the idea of comparing with the worst. Uh, I thought you made all your points. Just by comparing with the worst example. Uh, if North Korea is really bad, or maybe the worst in the world, that does not mean that we should turn a blind, a blind eye on China, for example. By <coughs> comparing the Syrian regime, which is maybe the worst, what, what, by comparing Turkish health areas that we know that are full of human rights violations, we saw the invasion of Afrin and uh, what happened there, all these violations, but that does not mean that we should turn a blind eye on what's going on in, in Raqqa and Israel and other places. Um, months ago, for example, Syrian women were uh, protesting, uh, asking for uh, the release of their husbands from SDF prisons. They were called by the um, uh, SDF media as working in prostitution or uh, linked to ISIS. You know how insurgents and security these are. Uh, these, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it. Anyway. Another example, of, um, I want to talk um, uh, about the celebration, or forcing people to celebrate uh, the birthday of Abdullah al um, This is an aspect of absolutism. Um, we are talking about um, forcing people to celebrate uh, the birthday of a um, uh, political leader. Um, and for the people of Raqqa, for example, I, I know so this person does not mean anything for them. Um, I want to ask you about this. Thank you. Good questions. Lady there. Yeah, looking for a, a geopolitical way forward. Um, Cyprus and Eastern Mediterranean. Um, just a couple of months ago, there was a um, cry in the Turkish Parliament that it's time for Aisha to go on holiday again. Um, this is reference to the invasion of Cyprus, of course, in the 70s. <coughs> and I sort of for a moment had a hope that, well, maybe that will wake up the Western forces, particularly Britain, having you know, a military presence there, and the fact the amount of hydrocarbons there are now in the eastern Mediterranean, that it could actually lead to quite a major conflict uh, within that whole eastern Mediterranean area. But also, what will it take, you know, when, what do you think it will take for that geopolitical will to kick in, um, to, 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 you know, get involved, rather than all this talk of when should we pull out by, by Western? Perfect. Uh, hi, my question is, do you think that other Kurdish opposition, opposition groups like, for example, the EN, PF, who are quite close to Turkey and the Zani Alliance, do you think they can play a role in potentially deterring Turkish attacks or reaching a settlement? Okay. Well, good question there, Jill. Uh, have you got them? So the first one was... Um, maybe a bit about, step back a bit, what is this Kurdish issue, you know, kind of, um, what is the four parts of uh, um, Kurdistan, if, we, if that's the phrase to use in this context, and what's the end outcome? So a big question. Um, uh, we shouldn't be blind to some of the, you know, kind of we shouldn't just be roped into glasses to some of the, the issues that might be ongoing. But of course we have to understand in context, but is some of that stuff that's happening acceptable? Do we need to push for something better as well? Geopolitically, 
Cyprus, is there movements there? Is there movements that actually the West what will take the West to be woken up? And then finally, is there other uh, Kurdish groups? Can they do something? The Bazanis, the other groups that maybe have better links with other geopolitical actors? Four good questions. Well, one of the biggest questions. Yeah, so, yeah, so you have, I don't know, some people say 40 million Kurds, some people say more. Uh, so you have them in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. Um, uh, the strategy of the Iraqi Kurds, uh, they, have, they are one of the few Kurds that have a legal status because the Iraqi Kurdistan region is recognized by the Iraqi constitution. Uh, they tried to go for independence referendum, it didn't work out because most of the international community was against it and the regional countries also. So, so, sorry, can, sorry, sorry, but, but all, 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 oh, so those Kurds trying to form up their own sort of country, <laughs> separate from all the other Kurds? Well, the, you, the, you, 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 you well, talk about the sort of Turkish Kurds. Mm -hmm. Well, do the Turkish Kurds want to uh, set up their own sort of country? Let, 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 and the, the Syrian Kurds and all yeah, the other we, Kurds? We, we, we get the question. Or do, do we want well, yeah, let, one country? I, I don't this, know. Let's put this into political context. France and Germany came along and they yeah. drew lines on a map. Yeah, yeah. And what would have been one kind of one whole had a load of lines drawn. Yeah. yeah. So you have kind of a one hole here. Yeah, but, 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 but wait, wait, what's wait, your sort of no, vision yes, for I the get future? Yes, I have a question, so you don't need to interrupt. Um, so what you have there is four different kind of sections. Yes, I understand that. Who have then, of course, faced different political realities in four different. So to say there's one vision between is not necessarily the case. Some people would say one vision wants to be a kind of united Kurdistan. But the reality in some countries is so far away that's not even the discussion that can kind of can happen. So but, with a, uh, with but a, is that that no, way no, so you want to be? Let me let, let me just try and give you the informatic, yeah, and then and then we can come back to kind of the ideological, yeah. Um, you know, and, and so and so you have there with the the kind of the Kurdish regional government in Iraq, there is much more advanced level of political kind of autonomy, and so therefore there was a push and a step towards. Um, an idea of independence that possibly would have meant in the long run a growing independence of Kurdistan, but at the time was just about Iraqi uh, independence there. It was never exclusionary of the other areas. The other areas, particularly with Turkish um, uh, Kurds and actually some of the political influence of the Syrian Kurds, comes through a different political <laughs> journey because of the repression has been very different. And what you see there is a kind of Oshalan, Oshalan who is the, the, the spiritual leader of the Turkish uh, Kurds, comes, of course, with a different understanding and idea, where he actually says, maybe the project isn't about nation-state building at all. Maybe the project, we need to go beyond the nation-state, because otherwise we just build another nation-state that is as bad as the nation-states that we're suffering from. So is there a, <laughs> exactly. is there a kind of third way? Yes, exactly. Where you create kind of democratic confederalism, where you do bottom-up grassroots politics, and you then bring states together within states, but other regions that can cooperate within states, and you don't necessarily start to try and confront the state, but you just build something up from the bottom. And that's what we see practically being built up in the DFNS Rojava kind of area, where they're not where they are talking, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, about uh, not necessarily seceding from Syria, but having some sort of element of just grassroots democracy that we build up for all its flaws, okay? And then so, Iran uh, occurred, of course, are even further back in the political discussion, where actually this is such a theoretical discussion, it's almost just about survival, and lots of them are in refugee camps in the KRG. So the idea that there's one idea out of this isn't necessarily simple. There probably, in lots of people's hearts, is one kind of idea that you would have a kind of Kurdistan that was united, whether it's a state or not, where people can all cooperate together. And Should there the be a, a sort of vision of, of one, one Kurdistan? Should there be? Well, Should that, there be a vision of that? What's your view? Should there be? <laughs> and I'll go back to you with to the question, and then we'll move on to the other question. Thank you. I think that's quite difficult because you have four enemies uniting against you then. So. Okay. And I think we see in, your, in the Iranian Kurdistan that the Kurds are actually striving for autonomy, uh, but Iran, they never accepted any form of negotiations, and the Iranian Kurdish leaders that were trying to negotiate with Iran were always killed. 
Uh, and in Turkey, it's also quite uh, difficult. Actually, the Turks are trying to work within the Turkish political system directly with the HCP, Syria, etc. In the Iraqi Kurdistan, it's very different because you have a Kurdistan region on top of its recognized Iraqi constitution. But in general, uh, most of the Kurdish parties, they try to focus on their own region, let's say. But you also have transnational Kurdish movements. But in general, that doesn't, I mean, they are forced to work like this because of the division of Kurdish people in four uh, countries. Um, Blind eye to some of the, I guess we'll leave the answer to that kind of hanging because there is no clear answer, but I think we've got an idea of where different views might be. This blind eye question, do we, do we need to also at the same time be very clear about there are some things that we still expect um, the DFNS to do, which maybe some of their forces, the SDF, are not necessarily doing? Well, I, I think nobody denies that there are definitely also issues in, in the DFNS with uh, but it's not called the DFNS anymore. So, so, so what's the new name? So the new name is the uh, Self Administration of Democratic Administration of the North and East of Syria. North and East Syria. So they dropped this federalism uh, name because first of all to make it easier to have the negotiations with Damascus. You did say that at the beginning, yes. And, and also also because of the US basically. Because US is not very happy with this federalism kind yeah. uh, on, on the question. On the blind eye, I, I don't think there's I mean, I think there's definitely also issues that have to be addressed in the north and the east of Syria, but that's why I think they, they should be addressed, and, but there's a lot of tension actually for those issues. I don't think there's a blind eye, actually. I think there's a lot of people, every time something small happens in these areas under, that there's a lot of tension for that. And I don't see that attention for instance, if something happens when Turkey is doing it. So I think we should not ignore what's going on uh, in these areas. Not that it matters much anymore, Uh, but uh, I think 